Hi everyone, thank you for joining us online for this conversation with Dr. Kairani Baroka and Dr. Jamaica Heoli Mili Kalani Osorio. We are delighted to welcome Oka and Heoli to our virtual stage, along with all of you. My name is Lily Philpott and I am speaking to you from Brooklyn, New York, which is on ancestral and unceded Canarsie and Munsee Lenape land. I am going to quickly describe myself. I have light brown skin and short black hair. I'm wearing glasses. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and I have on big gold earrings. On the wall behind me, you can see part of a painting by a friend of mine. In the painting, you see a woman in a bright red, orange and green dress on a bright orange background. And in her right hand, she is holding a bird. I am the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop. For those of you who are new to the AAWW, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. At a time when our communities are specifically vulnerable, we continue to offer a space in which we can imagine a more just future. You can learn about our work and RSVP to other programs like this one at aaww.org events. Tonight, we are proud to join the Poetry Coalition, a vital national alliance of more than 25 independent poetry organizations, in curating a program exploring the theme, it is burning, it is dreaming, it is waking up, poetry and environmental justice. The line, it is burning, it is dreaming, it is waking up, is from the poem Map by the poet Linda Hogan. You can view the incredible programming that our fellow organizations are curating from March through June 2021 at poets.org. Our event is titled, We Have Lived This Ending Before, which I drew from Haley's poem, Notes on Surviving the End of the World Again, which you will hear her read from shortly. During this event, we ask that all audience members practice nonviolence in the chat. Comments that are racist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, and or misogynist will be flagged and the person will be removed from this event. Again, I am so honored that Haley and Oka joined us for this vital conversation on land, ancestry, resistance, and so much more. I'm going to briefly share their bios and then we'll turn the mic over to them to introduce themselves. Dr. Kairani Baroka is a writer and artist from Jakarta based in London. Her work has been presented widely in more than 15 countries and work from her Anna Infinite series of performance installations has been an art forum must see. Among Oka's honors, she was a UNFPA Indonesian Young Leader Driving Social Change, an NYU Tisch Departmental Fellow and Modern Poetry and Translations Inaugural Poet in Residence. She is currently Associate Artist at the National Center for Writing and Research Fellow at UAL's Decolonizing Arts Institute. Her books include Indigenous Species from Tilted Axis, Stares and Whispers, Deaf and Disabled Poets Write Back, her debut collection Rope from Nine Arches Press and Ultimatum Orangutan also from Nine Arches Press, which you will hear her read from shortly. Dr. Jamaica Heuli Mele Kalani Osorio is a Kanaka Maoli Wahine artist, activist, scholar, born and raised in Palolo Valley to parents Donathan and Mary Osorio. Heoli earned her PhD in English and Hawaiian literature in 2018 from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Currently, Heoli is Assistant Professor of Indigenous and Native Hawaiian Politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Heoli is a three-time national poetry champion, poetry mentor, and a published author. She is a proud past Kayapuni student, board fellow, and graduate of Kamehameha, Stanford University, and New York University. Her book, Remembering Our Intimacies, Mu'olelo, Aloha Aina, and Ea, is forthcoming with the University of Minnesota Press in fall 2021. Please join me in welcoming Oka and Heoli to our stage. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, my name is Kairani Baroka and I go by Oka. I am a Minang Javanese writer and artist. Um, I'm currently based in London, um, working at University of the Arts London's Decolonizing Arts Institute. Um, I have the closest relationship to land in Jakarta, which is the capital city of Indonesia, where I'm from, but also to my mother's village in Tanah Datar and my dad's hometown of Jogja. So around the archipelago, really, um, and I hope for uh, 
across indigenous solidarities to be um, also in my conception of, of, of land all the time when I'm thinking about the world. A uh, visual description of myself, I am, uh, uh, I have my hair is tied back, I'm wearing red lipstick and glasses, I have a um, couple of watercolor paintings that uh, a friend has made behind me that are framed that are of imaginary animals, I'm wearing a gray t-shirt and white and green silver earrings, um, and I am a female presenting person with brown skin. My pronouns are she, her, or the Indonesian pronoun dia. So I'm going to read from this book, Ultimatum Orangutan or Ultimatum Orangutan. It's a bilingual title. So you, if you say it with an accent, then I guess you're saying it in Indonesian. Um, and this photo on the front is a photo of Tanah Datar, which is the area of West Sumatra that my mom's from. And I sort of imagined myself as having like superpowers along with all my friends and we can, um, deflect all the bulldozers and things that are coming at us. Hopefully that's how that works in real life. So I'm going to begin by reading a poem called Horizon, then a few other poems for the next five minutes. Horizon. Who will count our ledgers when sun pops over the Golan Heights? Bird feeders filled with ossified seed sludge, metal corroding in the mouths of cockroaches. No one to understand how I made you moan or Catalan or Fermat's theorem. No soul to comprehend tangents, singularity, the trappedness of living. What did I ask Allah for when I was slight? in my own row at the school masjid uniformed. Did I ask for eternal life in an Eden interpreted by women? Did I want the ticking of thermometer spikes as a way to ascertain that yes, hellfire and Noah's flood would come back around for the lot of us? Eons of wisdom in the great West Sumatran edifice was burned in a fire my veins preserving a wistful hum to the tune of crackling, nothing is new. Spears and gunpowder, noose on a slave in Batavia, old folks thinking they'd once been the babes slung over their father's backs. I miss a time when my elders smiled alive on us, but scores then had already died on the spark of a stealth Washingtonian hit list around virescent fields. When do we ever know to turn off the clock? What a portion of time ever means in multitude? If all these mocking were truthful, they'd be a dribbling constancy of tears, hooting cackles, nostalgia pouring into mugs of tight facts, all ochre glow not found in accumulation of bells induced by a sense for numbers of acolytes. But if I knew the answer, for where in this tiny orb, we are meant to find constancy of grace never ending. I'd go off and sing, self-satisfied. Um, this one is entitled Natural History Museum. At Montessori's colacanth animatronic hypnotists stand vigil over lone paragraph, cocoon wrapped on indigenous people's uncredited boon to European science. Dissected human women then throng display halls. Our feathered reptiles, mineral keychains, armadillo taxidermy, empress arachnids, espresso cues to purchase donation, Latin lingua franca of ancient skewed orders, visitors to Kensington allowed to fly home upon quiet capture by gift shops in CCTV. The key to survival is L. The cause of extinction is G. Ghost orchid is wisdom. Her presence skeletal. Rules all chances of escape in the living from spirit preservation in transparent jars. This last one is entitled in which I hypnotize a tiger. Um, so in researching this poem, I have discovered parts of my Minangkabau culture on my mom's side. So Minang or Minangkabau were the largest matrilineal culture in the world. Um, 
and there's always stuff I'm finding out because so much of my upbringing was Muslim Minangkabauness and and I'm learning more and more about indigenous spiritualities related to Minangkabau and one of those things is that tigers are what we call inya which is the word for grandparent so we believe that tigers are manifestations of our ancestors uh, which explains a lot of why I've been obsessed with tigers for a long time so this is entitled in which I hypnotize a tiger not made for Blake quotes and tinder profiles not squandered for bullets slung as attempts at gumption, not slit with knives on colonist orders then strung up, not sold to a venture capitalist who'll place her pale feet and heels and on you, not vanishing, not a chipmunk cheeked emoji, not bedtime threat to children in cold climates, not CGI recreation with an underappreciated actor voicing you, not a bevy of ill-advised tattoos, not the hangover, not sports team embodiment, not go get em, not taxidermy, not species forgotten, not a name used for foreplay, not a fantastic form of balm for soothing creaking muscle tissue, not a totem for my calming alone, not tired and misunderstood and hiding and rotting and gone, scream without shame or fear of banishment. This is no forest of wounding, tribulation, dust of your bone, Lick your paws, open your eyes. Thank you, and thank you to Lily and the Asian American Writers Workshop and Haley, who I'm really looking forward to hearing from next. Hello, my kako. O vauno o Jamaica Haley Mali Kalani Osorio he kupa no ka aina o palolo akano vau ma wahewa ikimana ho. Hello, my name is Jamaica Heoli Malikalani Osorio. I am a Kanaka Maoli Wahine, Native Hawaiian, born and raised in Palolo Valley on the island of Oahu, um, in the middle of our beautiful Grand Moana Nui Pacific Ocean. Uh, but these days I live actually in the center of my island uh, in Wahiawa, um, up in the heights with my Ohana, with my family. Um, I come from, of course, a long line of, of Native Hawaiian storytellers and activists and intellectuals um, who most actually hailed from a much larger island in, in our Pai Aina, Hawaii Island um, in particular. My father was born and raised in Hilo uh, in Keokaha and his parents and kupuna grandparents and, and elders were raised along the Hamakua coast which means I come from a family that grew up and loved and lived and fought in the malu, in the shade and protection of our majestic and sacred mountain, Mauna Awakia. Um, so today when I read, I'll, I'll share a little bit about that mountain and, and the contemporary movement to protect her. Um, a little visual description about me. Um, I am, how do I describe my visual appearance? I've never had to do this before. Okay, so I'm wearing a black shirt. Uh, I have short hair. I'm a nerd, so my background is covered with books um, and a white wall and a little bit of kind of blurry paintings and screen prints and, and photographs. Um, I have a light brown skin and I am also wearing um, a necklace that was carved for me by one of my dear friends, um, Maka. Um, yeah. And I have, uh, I have lots of tattoos. Well, I have lots of traditional Hawaiian tattoos. Uh, that makes me very easy to point out in a crowd. Um, as, as a native Hawaiian woman, um, as, a, as a Wahine who is indigenous to uh, Oceania, um, I believe that all of our liberations are tied together. Um, all indigenous people, all people of color's liberations are, are tied together. So today I'm gonna read two poems. Um, that speak both to the end of the world and then um, a, a beginning of the world as well. Uh, this first poem was written by request after there was a false missile alert in Hawaii in, I, I can't remember the date, but in sometime in, in 2018, we got an alert that there was a missile, a nuclear missile coming to Hawaii uh, and for us all to take cover. And for 38 minutes, uh, the entire, um, Hawaii population believed that we were about to die. And so I wrote a poem about what it means to live under the tyranny of militarism and imperialism that has us fearing our constant death. 
On the morning you wake to the end of the world, take your body back to the kai, to the place Arkupuna taught us life began. First pole, then coral, then slime, then a whole universe fitting into a space smaller than a grain of sand then air rising through the ocean, pulling the tides that make mountains, valleys, and the rivers that cut through them. Remember our Aina, our land, for all the ways she has fed us. In the quiet darkness before the blast, dive yourself back into the depth of creation, recalling all the times your world has ended before. Call out the names of all the violences that have come while calling itself protection. All the ways we have been left to gather the shattered pieces, two island cities in the core of the Pacific, flattened into caricature, names rendered meaningless, carved over and over again into the binding of our textbooks, just enough of their shape remains to call foul at our hubris, but does nothing to slow the arrogant push of progress. In their toxic wake came our imperial lake, our grand Moana Nui cut wide open, so on the morning you wake to the end of the world, Chant all the names of your dead and dying. Refuse to forget Kaho'olave, Makua, Pohakuroa, Mokoli'i, and then look to the horizon. Call upon the memory of hundreds of tests carried across our oceanic backs, Bikini and Anawatak, Kirimati and Kalama, Merlinga and Imu, Maruroa and Fangaraufa, and all the unnamed caught choking down wind. Epeli Hawofa's beautiful sea of islands vision perverted into a sea of toxic waste, the enduring gift from our American, British, and French protectorates. So on the morning you wake to the end of the world, remember, we have lived this ending before. Each bomb of history its own strike, the coming of ships, the spreading of death, the taming of industry, the carving of land, crosses and cultures until all that was left is what could be packaged and sold back at a premium, all because the men with the plans called power promised us security behind the barrel of a gun, cut a fortress out of a breadbasket and called it productive warships, cannons and gatling guns pointed at our palace then fixed into the eevee of our mountains for protection, none of it will save us from the violence that will continue. Bullets only beget more bullets, bombs only beget bigger bombs, and in the end, all we are left with this waste waiting. And still, all this death is not enough to force our forgetting. Our water, our moana, has a memory, and we are made in her image together, meaning we are intimately connected and infinitely powerful. So who but ourselves to hold us accountable when none of what has been built will save us from what cannot be called back? Remember this mo'olelo, this story, the air of change is heat. The air of life only rises from aina and kai. There is no part of you that is meant to survive when the cost is this place perched up as collateral damage, America's shining shield sitting in the heart of the Pacific, warning blast, a warning blast calling for what's next. Know this. On the morning you wake to the end of the world, your vision will be 2020, so use it. As the men with the plans called power call out from behind their screens to tell you to take cover, see beyond the violence of their contradiction, the enduring waste of their direction, call upon your own mana to make a change, choose to remember our aina, this kai, these kuahivi, are even more they have, all they have witnessed, even more they have endured and still stand to protect us. Follow their wisdom, come Armageddon or high water, hold them close, Pull a pule from your na'o. Call out to your akua by name and commit to live your life in their image, no matter what the consequence. And maybe, just maybe, the world may not have to end again tomorrow. Um, and uh, this, this next poem I'm gonna read um, is called uh, Until the Very Last Aloha Aina. And it was written in the early days of the establishment of the Pu'uhonua o Pu'uhuru, which was uh, both a, a, play, a traditional spiritual place of refuge and also a frontline encampment um, that was established in July of 2019 as my lahui, my people, um, gathered 
to block the movement of construction vehicles that threaten to desecrate uh, one of our most sacred aina. Ask me about the Mauna and I will tell you about 30 Kanaka huddled shivering in an empty parking lot praying the Lahui would answer the call. I will tell you about two nights spent caught sleeping directly under a sky scattered in stars and air so clear every inhale is medicine. How every morning I woke to a Lahui Kanaka growing as if we were watching Maui fish us one by one from the sea. Ask me about the Mona and I will tell you how on the third morning I watched this 30 became 100, then 100 became 1,000, then 1,000 became us all, each and every one of our kua, kua standing beside us. Ask me about the Mona and I will tell you the mo'olelo of eight kanaka chained to a cattle grate and the kokua who sat beside us. How we were never alone in the malu of a Mauna, how no one is ever alone in the malu of our Mauna. Ask me and I will recount their names. All 38 kupuna, one after the other, who showed us mo'opuna how to stand, how I wept and wept and wept as I quietly held their names in my chest. Ask me, and I will sing the song of our manawahime, linked arms and unafraid, who stood in the face of a promise of sound cannons and mace. Ask me, and I will tell you how this body has been changed, how home, takes on a new meaning these days, how family shows up at exactly the right time and place. And I will say, I have been transformed here, but I won't have the words to quite explain. I will say, I am not exactly sure who I will be when this ends. I am not exactly sure who we will be when this ends. But at the very least, I will know that this Aina, this land, did everything it could to feed me. That will be enough to keep me standing. Mahal. Thank you both again for those incredibly beautiful readings. Thank you for being here and giving um, us this, this time and space on this afternoon. Um, I have so many questions I wanna ask both of you, but I do wanna start with a couple of questions about language and about craft. Um, so you both write in English, but with Hawaiian and Indonesian included throughout. I'm curious to hear how you are intentionally disrupting colonial legacies with your choices of language. How do you intentionally write away from a white, colonial, American, British gaze and or framework? Um, and what is the role that these languages play in your work? Um, I, I can start if that's okay. And I think what we're going to just have a conversation, I guess. Um, firstly, I think it's really precious to be in this space where we're both people whose lands and peoples have been affected so much by American imperialism. Um, when I was in my poem Horizon, when I talked about a self Washingtonian hit list, what a lot of people don't know is that um, in 1965-66, the CIA helped orchestrate a genocide of suspected communists, which ended up in maybe a, a, about 3 million people killed. This included, you know, the Indonesian women's movement. So it was like a genocide of feminists, artists, labor organizers. It's really intense. Um, that's actually where my parents met and fell in love as, as student activists. Um, kind of in the uh, against the dictatorship that lasted for 30 decades after that and in which I was brought up. Um, and I think that it's really important to have these oceanic connections because we are not alone in all the trauma and genocide that we have experienced. And um, I think that just saying, choosing this title for my book, Orangutan is actually an Indonesian term. So orang means person or people and utan means forest. So when you say orangutan, you're saying people of the forest. Mm -hmm. And that's also the name that we call the orange animals that are in the Jungle Book cartoon. <laughs> Not just, I never describe it in the way that I want to, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Um, so we also call animal orangutans orangutan, but it also literally means person or people of the forest. Um, and I think it speaks to how and this notion of like Anthropocene is so new. It's like, no, since the beginning of colonialism, as many, many people have said and indigenous scholars, like 
there has been this Western colonial project to divorce, including in language, like land, mind, body. Like that's why, you know, when I perform about tigers, like I'm performing about my ancestors. And when we say orangutan, we're talking about animals, but we're also, it's literally people of the forest. So um, I think there are like little Easter eggs in that that I like to point out to people. Um, I think also Indonesian is a colonial language in a sense, because it was created as sort of a lingua franca to unite the over 17,000 islands of Indonesia against colonial forces. So like for in the battle for independence, Indonesian was like a useful tool so everybody could communicate with each other. But now Indonesian is like a mandated national language and we're fighting for all these indigenous languages with smaller populations perhaps to continue to be revitalized. So I also kind of like to disrupt this idea that it's only a European to Indonesian relationship that is colonialism, when in fact the dictatorship installed by the US was extremely colonial, very Javanese, I'm half Javanese, but Javanese has been sort of like a colonizing language in those three decades. So um, yeah, just things I think about and hope come across. I'm sorry, my, my like the gears in my mind, you can't see them. They're like turning and turning and turning and spinning out of control. Um, I think this question of language is so important, um, even though sometimes it seems so so obvious, right? From, from the Hawaiian kind of perspective, any use of the Hawaiian language is, um, is one that is trying to disrupt a colonial legacy, right? It's especially when you look at, at Hawaii and other places, of course, other indigenous people who have had their languages, not just suppressed, but outlawed. Um, in Hawaii, we were like, they, they outlawed the use of the language in all uh, public um, service positions in our schools. And so the fact that the language exists is kind of a slap in the face to our like continued occupation um, and kind of living under the weight of American um, imperialism. But I think there's also something else happening in, in the use of when we insist on using our own languages. And, and a part of this, you know, Oka speaks really beautifully to is that our, there are connections being made and there's an orientation being framed when we speak from like the genuine truth of our ancestors, right? And so there are things that I could never say in the English language that need to be said. Um, and that is because the English language is not supposed to be a language of liberation. And, and that doesn't mean that people don't craft it and use it um, in movements towards liberation, but the language itself has not been made to serve us and people who look like us and people who live like us. And so when I think about um, the use of Olalo Hawaii, which is the, the word we use for, for our language, um, it, is, it is not so much um, a craft decision as it is a necessity. Um, it is, these are the words that come, these are the words that fall out of me when I'm trying to get as close as I can to the truth of the poem um, or to the truth of like the mo'olalo, the story that is behind the poem. Um, and, and then when we do that, of course, all these other really genuine um, maoli, we would say like in native indigenous connections are being made and my relationship both to those words but also my relationship to land is transformed by the way that i use hawaiian language um, those things are remembered right not just recalled but pieced back together um, when we use our language and then you know i would i would add that because usually when i talk about that people ask me like why don't i just write entirely in hawaiian um, and there are really, there are two reasons for this. One, I'm not a very good writer in Olalo Hawaii, like in all in Hawaiian, but the, but the other thing is that cultural suppression uh, has been so powerful in Hawaii that the majority of Hawaiians don't speak Hawaiian. And so if I want to speak to my people, which those are really the, most of the people that I want to talk to in the first place, then I have to engage with this oppressive and colonial language because Although it is not the language that my ancestors understand, it is the language that one of the languages that my descendants will. And so we live in that middle space between, you know, the end and the beginning of the world all the time, I think, as Native folks. Yeah, I think that, um, is, is it okay, Lily, to just, I, what you say about living in that middle space and having to exist and craft liberation on the topography of what has been left for us 
is real. That's really real. Um, I have a poem called Money for Your English where mm. I talk about how like um, I'm a disabled and chronically ill woman. If I want to be an independent person and like literally survive, I've had to take certain steps and that includes writing in English. And that includes um, also necessity because Indonesia can still be quite an authoritarian and uh, anti-freedom of speech place. So it's harder for people to ban my stuff. Um, like when I was still living in Indonesia, I wouldn't like my stuff wouldn't be, some galleries like refused to have me perform there because it was like too, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, and so I feel like writing in English adds this layer by which I won't get, you know, any pushback. Mm. But on the negative side, it's in English, right? But then, then, you know, what I'm thinking, I think about these all the time, uh, these things all the time. And also for people like today is International Trans Day of Visibility. And um, we're doing projects with trans and disability justice solidarities in Jakarta. And it's like a lot of LGBTQ plus people in Indonesia use, like they tweet in English, they write in English, but that's because, again, it's another layer mm -hmm. so that like their families won't find out or, you know, they don't get outed at their place of work. So it's like, it's so hard sometimes to, you know, like reconcile yeah. colonialities and these dynamics that we didn't choose are there. Like. I, I think a part of that speaks to, um, you know, I, I hate when people just talk about how resilient um, indigenous people are, but like how flexible and, and ingenious actually we are, as you say, like in building on top of this, like topography of devastation, like what's been left. Um, and, and then in that work, then that actually requires us to be really like self-reflexive too. And like, are we, are we creating towards a liber liberatory future for all of us in what's left or, um, because I because I have seen the way that in Hawaii in particular that um, we can we can allow that that trauma to how can I say this um, to keep us from holding ourselves accountable to our highest level of self um, and to the highest vision of future um, of liberation um, and we can cause harm to other people um, whether it is um, uh, queer folks, women, gender non-conforming folks, or other folks throughout the Pacific with this like this idea of Hawaiian exceptionalism and what we have done with what has been left. So I'm I'm really moved by by the idea that we have to continue to like recenter in this space um, and both be be flexible in the tools that we have, but also be really um, I guess aware of our own power and of what is of our making. Um, you sort of started to touch on my next question al already a little bit, um, but I want to hear, I want to sort of ask both of you about oral traditions. Um, and Oka, I'm interested in hearing you speak a little bit about the way your work incorporates Indonesian oral tradition and particularly in relation to your work with accessible and multi-sensorial art. Um, just sort of asking kind of towards the idea of, you know, what kind of memory and history are inseparable from oral tra tradition that you want to preserve? Um, yeah, I think that I didn't really get free until I became disabled, <laughs> until I started becoming politically disabled and identifying as that and pushing for access and realizing that access can be generative. Um, I think obviously, you know, Indonesia is a country of over 700 languages, at least. Um, and a lot of these oral traditions are being wiped out or they're erased or they're, I mean, for instance, pantum in English comes from pantun, which is an Indonesian and Malay lyric form. And I recently wrote a poem um, about ilau, which is like this collective mourning ritual where basically if you're grieving something and it can be like, or a breakup or a death or something like it's, in community and it's kind of like improvised pantun, like improvised poetry and everybody's like feeding out each other and it's really beautiful um and again it's something that i you know i wasn't taught about i had to go and research and find out about um and it when you teach pantum which might some people here in the uk think it's french because they were taught this 
poetic form in school. Oh, it's a fancy name, must be French, of course, right? <laughs> and it's completely divorced from this communal context. And also, like, pantun is used in weddings still, you know? Um, uh, like, pantun, like, friendly pantun battles. It's it, This is something that is still contemporary. So um, I think that just, I, I always try and, like, recenter, like, this actually comes from my oral tradition. You know, I think that's really important for me here in the UK to continue to do that. Um, but also in terms of accessibility, uh, I think becoming aware of how everything can be made in some form more accessible and multisensorial really opens you up to a lot of different possibilities. Um, uh, I only fully realized, I mean, I, I kind of knew this my whole life, but I only fully realized that as Javanese people, we have disabled gods when I became disabled. So we have disabled gods, but with the advent of colonial Dutch medicine, and I have a colleague, Slamat Amex Tohari, who's a, another disabled writer, and he wrote a book on this called Disability in Java. So thanks to Amex. Um, with the advent of colonial Dutch medicine, everything switched to the medical model, where if you were different or non-normative, your difference had to be eliminated. And that was so successful that you know, I mean, like this, this is something I had to realize in my like mid twenties that like, oh yeah, I know we have disabled gods, like their images, their stories, but you don't, the ableism is so internalized. So that it's just been really important to recenter how actually this ableism is part of colonialism and we, we were wiser. <laughs> um, it's been really important to me. Thank you so much for sharing that. I wasn't aware of so much of that. So I'm grateful to learn. Um, and Heuli, I want to ask if you can speak a little bit to Hawaiian oral and musical traditions and sort of creating and reciting an archive and a history in song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, most people around the world who who have heard of Hawaii, like they, they know that we have a pretty impressive musical tradition. Um, but what I, what I think is important is to, to tie that back into the even larger kind of oral tradition that, that Hawaii has. And like, like most native people, Hawaii was, um, like many native people, Hawaii was a purely oral tradition until the arrival of missionaries in the 1820s, um, which to me, it, it baffles me the kind of knowledge that we can hold in our bodies, right? When I think about an oral history, right? It means that everything I know is in the land and in my body. Um, and as someone who like almost everything I know is in my books, like this is a really difficult thing to kind of reconcile, but always like feel this great sense of awe for my ancestors and my kupuna and the, and the kinds of knowledges that they held in their bones um, and that they practice, which means you have to practice these things, right? Otherwise that they die. Um, otherwise they, they cease to exist. So this, I think this history gave way to, to a really powerful, uh, a musical tradition. And what's really, what's really amazing about our kind of contemporary musical tradition in Hawaii, and I'm probably using contemporary wrong because I'm thinking, you know, the last hundred years, let's talk about the last hundred years, right? In the musical tradition in Hawaii, um, our mele, that's our word for music, have has been instrumental in returning Native Hawaiians back into a sense of kind of cultural pride and, and practice. And so I think of people like my father who, um, you know, my father grew up in Hilo um, to um, a father who identified as American. My grandfather is, was a Hawaiian Portuguese man who very strongly identified as an American and a Republican. Um, and so they were certainly raised with a kind of sense of like assimilation and, and turning towards a certain standard of, of American life. Um, and so there was no reason to believe that my father would at any point kind of recenter himself into the teachings of his ancestors. But here's the thing, my father and my grandfather were in love with Hawaiian music. And my grandfather sang hundreds of songs in Hawaiian, couldn't speak a word of Hawaiian, but when he sung these songs, you could swear he knew exactly what he was talking about. And so that passed on a tradition to my father and then a love within my father for his language and wanting to dig deeper and understand like, what are these things that I'm singing? And so I think about our music as this really powerful space that has been able to call people home um, in such like an accessible way, right? Like come sing the song that your grandmother used to sing for you as you fell asleep, but then come to realize that this song is, is connected to a vibrant tradition of 
anti-American imperial resistance, um, but also a tradition of, of being living with more genuine connection to each other and to our land. Um, so I, I think about this then in terms of what are these songs and stories and poems? What are they gonna offer us for the future? How, how are these things going to be instrumental as they always have been in, in gathering the collective, right? When we sing our songs, uh, there is both a sense of like this whole papa, this battle that, you know, Oka talks about this, this friendly battle of, of music and, and, and story, but it is also how we call out to each other when we sing. That is what brings the gathering. Um, that is what begins the party. Um, and I mean party, not just in like the celebration, but like prepares people for the battle that is ahead. Um, and so that's what I think about when we sing um, and when we write and when we speak. And, you know, in the face of all the ways that that our oppressors have tried to silence us, I, I also think about how wonderful it is that uh, we've never shut up. I really love this idea of a Republican <laughs> singing songs that are so antithetical to the Republican <laughs> Party's belief, like oh, ac yeah. accidentally or however and, you want to. Yeah, and my, my grandfather, he, um, he was so conservative in, in so many ways. Um, and in particular, you know, my grand, I know my grandfather loved me, but he certainly was not a, you know, didn't understand women who loved other women and didn't understand men who loved other men and certainly didn't understand folks who didn't fit into the category of man or woman. But he sang these songs that from our contemporary understanding were so queer, like these, and he would sing with so much aloha about these people in these mele that were sharing all kinds of love that were outside of his political experience. And so to me, that just, um, yeah, it's, it's something about our stories and our music that no amount of missionary beating really um, could, could like beat out of us. That, it's like a prank from the ancestors. <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. We've been speaking about it already, but I would like to um, talk a little bit about resistance and think about kind of ancestral and contemporary forms of resistance. And I have um, questions for each of you, but again, I do want to hear, you know, your thoughts and responses to each other as well. So please feel free to hop in. Um, Haley, I wanted to ask, if you could share a little bit about your scholarship on Aloha, which you have written about as a radical form of activism and healing and also a form of resistance um, and sort of the ways that your poetry and activism puts those ideas into practice. For sure. So um, Aloha is probably one of the most commonly appropriated and misused words out of like Hawaiian culture, right? It's like this thing that has been commodified to sell Hawaii to this outrageous over like outrageous um, corporate capitalist tourism model, right? And so everyone, most people around the word, world has have heard the word aloha before and they have their own attachments to what that means, whether that like reminds them of a Disney movie or, you know, of a vacation in paradise. Um, and you know, in, in my perspective and in the perspective of, of many other kind of indigenous and Hawaiian scholars, aloha, of course, um, means something very different than something that can be sold and made plastic. Um, and historically, at, at least, you know, contemporarily, actually, people have, people in my community have fought for us to see, um, to kind of divorce aloha from this commodified practice. But very little has been done to actually look at how aloha is counter- um, hegemonic, it is counter hetero, like hetero patriarchal and is very like queer in its sense, right? This, this understanding of Aloha, this thing that ties us to each other, but also ties us to our land and that there are all these different examples of, of an Aloha that is really defiant 
to the particular things we were taught by missionaries in the 1820s. And so I look at Aloha both as, as something that can be and quoting another poet, Nobu Revilla, who is evoking another poet, Haunani K. Trask, Aloha is rage and rapture. Aloha is also this thing that can inspire us to, Aloha doesn't have to be passive. It doesn't have to be welcoming. Aloha can say no. Um, Aloha can build alternatives to the worlds that we live in. And so there's that side of Aloha, but then there's this also this other really beautiful and power, powerful side of Aloha that, that recognizes that all the different ways we have historically found pleasure and safety and care with each other, that that is also aloha. Um, and time and time again, our occupiers and our colonizers, you know, we can even just think of like the state of Hawaii, they will try to co-op this language to create something that looks liberal, um, that looks comfortable, that looks like they're honoring the past of the native people whose land they continue to to settle on and steal um, but time and time again we will remind them that like aloha doesn't fit into this capitalist model that have, has been cast across our islands um, and so because of that when we talk about resistance in hawaii and and i should say i i really like the word resistance um, but not everyone does uh, some people prefer you know words like instead of calling us activists, they like to call ourselves protectors, which I believe we're also protectors, but I, I like the word activist and I like the word resistance. And I, I like the kind of fiery fight that comes in response to violence. Um, what I want us, to, what I want people to constantly think about though, is that even in that like fiery fight in response to violence, there is still aloha there. And it is actually aloha that requires us to stand and fight in these ways. And that aloha that requires us to see that our protection of land um, will call us to also protect each other. And if we cannot do both, then we are not practicing aloha. Um, if we cannot see the way that we are all connected in, in this, like what I would call an penna of people, in a like fishnet of intimacy and care, um, then we are doing something else. Maybe we're doing love, but we're not doing aloha. Um, and so all the ways we can kind of reclaim this language, but also reclaim the practices and the intimacies that come with it, um, I think are really, really important. Beautiful. Um, my question for you, Oka, actually, I think sort of touches on reclaiming language as well. Um, I'm interested in hearing if you could speak a little bit about your poem, Climactic, which, you know, in my reading really feels like it maps colonial violence on the body, on time. It contains this wish um, to undo each spool of violence until C is in balance again with our bloodstreams. Um, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about this, this poem and sort of in relation to what Haley was saying as well about this reclamation of, um, of language and, and our resistance as well. For sure. It's occurred to me that all three of us are uniting on this, you know, like invisible Wi Fi plane from three different island histories of imperialism in the Pacific, which is kind of cool land and sea and air. Um, yeah, so my Poem Climactic begins palm oil slicks manifest in heat in so many beats of life. The instant noodles purchased are extraction from home soils, plantations laid out in mechanical lines. Um, Indonesia is the world's largest producer of palm oil. And um, in my first book, Indigenous Species, which, uh, so I'm holding up a page from the book and I, I, I illustrated it with a combination of traditional and contemporary prints, but I always, always, always knew that I wanted to illustrate a lipstick made out of rainforest because that's where we get our lipsticks and soaps and shampoos from is the stealing of land from indigenous peoples and palm oil plantations and that's why I feel like there's such a disconnect sometimes between especially being in London where it's so much this like very white supremacist eco-fascism that is so pervasive that's like vegan everything and then I'm being like no but palm oil and then like palm oil because of the orangutans which is another reason why i titled my book ultimatum orangutan because i have this poem ultimatum orangutan about how like i will see this giant billboard in the middle of london like no palm oil because at this store because we love and respect the orangutans and it's like that literally means peoples of the forest 
that means that there are people in that forest and I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah. and this whole, like, I mean, completely not understanding like, the, the history of conservation has been so colonial and all of these like national parks are, you know, like made on evictions and mass. And that is currently happening in my country so much. Um, they recently, there, I mean, there's this new omnibus law that is coming in Indonesia and it's like, it accelerates the capitalist neoliberal agenda so much more and it's already so terrifying. Um, my relationship to the word activism has always been, I think shaped really intimately with my relationship to my father who um, he like represented, helped you know, indigenous peoples at the UN FCCC when I was still a girl. Um, but to this day, like just yesterday, he was on a book launch panel um, on palm oil effects and I noticed like he doesn't even tell us about these things when they're happening. I had to find out because a friend's husband <laughs> was there <laughs> and I was like, your dad's speaking of this. And he just put like learner, like student at the school that he helped co-found. And I was just like, I, I mean, I'm just kind of in awe of this humility. And also the word activism is like really kind of uh, interlaced with all this like traumatic stuff with me really internalizing the defeats that he and his friends experienced and like how much would hinge on it and the unsafety and the risk that they took and still took and like fear for my father's life so it's all it's a bit <laughs> I still I feel still feel a bit funny saying it because even though I have experienced a lot of physical pain in my you know whether it's access activism and trying to do art and not being given access, um, like, you know, uh, pain and trauma at the hands of medical institutions, especially, I don't feel, I feel like I'm not necessarily worthy of the title of activist. I know that different people have different relationships to it, and I fully support the word. I just feel for me personally, there's something in it that's like really tied up with a lot of like childhood angst at like, oh no, they're fully destroying everything. And it's still happening as an adult. So, you know, trying to figure out how to deal with those histories communally and emotionally is something that is still a work in progress for me. Um, but so palm oil is a really, really big part of it. And with regards to eco-fascism, I was once on a panel <laughs> with, it was so, I mean, it's, it's like very darkly funny as a lot of these things are, right? So it was me, um, a white woman in the center because she was centered and on the other side of this white woman was a writer from the Caribbean and this white woman in the center said um <laughs> uh you know all of these things you know the industrial revolution everything all of this was made to help people's lives be better and me and the other writer I, I would say her name, but I don't, you know, I don't feel unnecessary of the right to say, you know, to tell her sorry. We literally looked over this woman's head and we, <laughs> we gave each other the look like, uh, and we both said separately, you know, colonialism and extraction and exploitation were a huge part of what led us to this point in both our countries. And the, 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 the level to which there were literally like, you know, completely not aware of um and things saying things like we should all just move to the cities that's what you know fully just this divorcing of nature from land and mind and body and later i i tried to say and the, there was a q a and there's a young woman who said you know i mean but we're in the city we're in london we're so far away from nature like how to get away from nature i mean one that's not true because london actually has tons of parks lot london's a very forested city which a lot of people don't actually know but also i was like did if you had a pork sausage for breakfast this morning that is nature it was exploited nature but it was you know like how do you feel separate from every other living thing and this person did not understand it and i thought oh my god like it's such a and so for me, I feel like I, I'm, I'm trying to save my energy from trying to speak about our points of view to people who still think in this very reductionist, like biodiversity credits, carbon credits, everything is like scientific, you know what I mean? Like just everything can be um, turned into something that is quantifiable according to numbers. Um, and and uh, so also that everything, you know, 
as long as we get to keep our Western lifestyles where we are, as long as this new liberal idea of progress can happen, then it doesn't matter how many worlds we destroy. And it is so hard to shift people, but I, I really think that, um, I mean, I, uh, the book's been out a week and I'm already hearing from some people being like, wow, I didn't realize like how Western and colonial our conceptions of nature are. And I was like, yes, you know, like this is, it's, I, I talk about palm oil a lot because it affects uh, myself and my communities so much. And I feel like there's, oh, there is, you know, with, especially with the whole, like, as long as it's plant-based, it's okay for the environment thing. That is really destructive. And I just, I just really want to hammer it home. I've written quite a few poems about it in different ways. Um, in indigenous species, but also in ultimatum orangutan and climactic for me, there's like the K is, um, I don't know if you can see, there's like uh, ellipses around the K. So it's like climatic, which is like relating to the climate, but it's also climactic because it's climactic. Um, because I do want to, as you mentioned, Lily, like undo each spool of violence until C is in balance again with our bloodstreams. Because I just feel like every interaction that I that I have gotten myself roped into, whether it's me buying soap that I only realize, you know, it like has sodium laurel so, as SLS or like a derivative of palm oil, you know, that I don't realize it's we're all so caught up in these capitalist frameworks that we're so complicit in them. And it's so, I mean, I live in London, you know what I mean? Like the, the dark heart of empire, like who am I to be like, you know, like I really, you know, I, I, I just want all of these relationships to be unspooled, to bring us back to a place. And I know that's impossible because not impossible in the sense of it won't ever be possible or that we shouldn't fight for it. But I, I know that it's impossible to, as one person or even as one community, unspool everything because it requires all of our communities. You know, we were talking about indigenous solidarities. And I think that, um, yeah, it's basically, long answer short, climactic is about my neuroses. <laughs> <laughs> about all of this and how maybe in 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 speaking about indigenous solidarities it's also a way to relieve ourselves of this the pressure that we can feel sometimes as members of indigenous communities i mean especially coming from places like indonesia where it's like bali and paradise and hawaii where emma stone is supposed to be the poster child for aloha which like <laughs> <laughs> which is like it's a travesty. It's such a, I mean, how? I don't even, I can't imagine. Wow. What a crime. That's <laughs> we have to laugh, right? Because it is so, it's so outrageous. Um, but but also, I, I feel so moved by by the way you're talking about the need to kind of detangle these, these colonial relationships, but I'm but what I'm also hearing and, and constantly thinking about is, is how much this is made possible by our disconnection, right? When you talk about how we all have to be pulling this apart together, the reason, one of the reasons that, one of the obstacles to that is that we see ourselves as so separate, right? Not just from each other, but also, like you say, like from our environment, that people, the whole, yeah, the whole conservation, the whole conversation on the conservation community, we don't even need to get into that in the way that they have decided um, really powerfully that there is, that there is human and there is nature and we are separate, right? And, and my, my intellectual and activist kupuna, like George Helm, who gave his life protecting Koholave when it was being bombed. He and his comrade, George Helm and Kimo Mitchell, gave their lives when our islands continued to be bombed from World War II all the way up into 1990. Um, he said there is, he said there is man and there is environment, there is no separation, neither like one doesn't supersede the other, right? And we're trying to get people back to that time scale and in understanding that we we are actually, from a Hawaiian perspective, we are actually our land. Our ancestors are the land that we walk on, so we cannot separate these things. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about all the ways that capitalism, um, imperialism, empire have tried to 
try to separate our communities and try to separate ourselves from each other. And so the, when I go back to this idea of aloha, which literally means like, I see life in you and I recognize you. It's this, this mutual recognition between not just two people, but between me and, and all of my histories and the person in front of me and all of their histories and all of their land. There is an expansiveness to that. Um, I, th I think about um, brilliant activists and, and, and historians like Teresia Te Iowa, who is also no longer oh. with Right? Who yeah. says we cry and sweat salt water so we remember that the the ocean is in our blood, right? That work was so important to my PhD dissertation, and oh. I'm so sad that I didn't get to talk to her before she passed away. Oh. Um, but yeah, again, with you know Polynesian, Hawaiian, Indonesian, Oceanic, you know, Pacific all these configurations of geography where we are here for each other. We are here. We have been here. Yeah. It's just wonderful yeah. to be in this kind of conversation and to have this kind of shorthand as well because of those apologies mm -hmm. if I was just bitching earlier. <laughs> but just like it's, I feel like it's so hard sometimes in the UK to, to get beyond those separations and that, that, that conception also of mastery over land like these are issues yeah. to solve and elon musk will solve them or something you know like it's and which and what what comes with it is such erasure of us like fully just like you don't exist because they don't know or they well i don't i think it's worse than that right it's willful you know right. <laughs> suppression and elimination and killings and all of these things so that now we're in a position where millions of people don't know about yeah that we exist. right and their, yeah. their, their, their entire geography right is telling them a particular story about about mastery over land and disconnection from nature as you say right like someone walking through london cannot conceive of the fact that they're connected to nature um because our geographies are mapped in a particular way so yeah it's outrageous the the <laughs> I have nothing else to say other than like, how do we follow the brilliant voices and, and, and mo'olalo and, and, and passion of, of people like Teresia who have, who have remade those connections in a vast, small islands in a vast sea. We are a sea of islands, uh, a sea of connectivity. I think of people like Teresia who actually went out and like reached her arms out into Oceania and she herself was that connectivity between so many ideas and um, and movements and dreams and um, for our future bringing in pedagogy mm -hmm. that i mean just from any of her work right like uh, mm -hmm. indigenous pedagogies into a supposedly colonial yes colonial <laughs> university setting um it's kind of i feel like there's there's a conception of sort of like, you know, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney have the undercommons of like being in the university, but not of it. And I feel like we we have already this indigenous undercommons mm. um, and we need to tap into it and center it. And, you know, really, I think in order to carry on and, and survive, part of it is getting good at blocking out what doesn't serve us. Um, and that part is, I think, hopefully the role of poetry, right, <laughs> which is so immersive, so connective, so immediate, um, where it doesn't even matter that these other, in the moment that we're reading or speaking or sharing, it doesn't even matter that people who think otherwise exist, because that's not what we're about, you know? Yeah. I mean, in, in my best moments, I feel like that, I don't know. <laughs> same and then when it's just me scribbling i'm like what is this doing <laughs> <laughs> so this this is like quite literally the creative space of revolution right like when we talk about um uh ruth wilson gilmore she talks about abolition is not an absence but a presence right and then the folks who study and practice abolition um and and have brought that language to the forefront. This is a creative process. Um, and so I think about how important it is that we have artists 
uh, that we celebrate and protect and honor the artists in our community who are doing that world making every day from the poem to to like the landscape and how how else can we create an otherwise future um, in this like like crazy dystopian novel that we live in, if not to be, um, to, if not to step fully into our creativity and in that creativity, bring with us our entire selves, which means to bring with us our connection to land, to bring with us our ancestors, to bring with us our languages. Um, because to me, that is like the greatest weapon we have against imperialism, against capitalism, against patriarchy, against um, this, this like immersive state violence that we live in. Um, For yeah. sure. And the word landscape too, that's how they got so much power over us, right? Is this framing of landscape, like um, the concept mm. of landscape painting and photography mm. was a Dutch import. And there's this Indonesian um, artist who existed as Sujoyono, who coined the term Moi Indi, which means beautiful Indies in Dutch, for the style of painting, which was like, Indonesia is this beautiful landscape, no colonial violence exists here. And that became basically the blueprint for how Bali has been colonized, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm sure it's the same in Hawaii, right? Like literally landscape is two dimensional to them. Yeah. It's, it's literally just to look at and to, you know, to consume. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think it's really important to understand like the genealogies of art too, as being so vital to this destructive process of, of people not conceiving of landscape in a different way and, and cosmologies and spiritualities as existing within them. Like when I was uh, a kid in elementary school, we all had to paint the exact same scene over and over, two hills, a road going through and a sunset between the two hills. And that's classic Moy Indi stuff, but I didn't realize it until I was like a grad student in visual cultures, right? Like, oh no, <laughs> I've been brainwashed by, you know, um, yeah, subliminally brainwashed, um, but didn't fully work. Um, yeah, so I, I agree. We need to honor the art that celebrates what we want to celebrate. Um. I actually want to skip ahead slightly in my questions to kind of continue this conversation we're having and Hayley to actually build off a little bit on what you were saying about this kind of creative space of revolution. Um, so I want to speak a little bit about the body and the idea of um, the ways that our bodies can kind of hold legacies of colonialism and imperialism, but are also sort of strongholds against colonialism and imperialism and, and, you know, further injustices. And I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on in what ways, you know, we can think about resistance and we can think about, um, as you were both saying, kind of pushing against this disconnect from nature, you know, pushing towards indigenous solidarities um, and kind of holding that in our body, in our bodies. Yeah, so, um you know, my, my immediate reaction to your question is in thinking about the, the holding of the legacy of colonialism. I, th I think, I think a lot about how as, as a Wahine who, who loves other Wahine, how I never, even to this day, like identified as a queer person. Like it's a, that's a word I use kind of to make myself visible to other queer folks. Um, but the, but the word itself, has ever found like home in me. And I think about the way that colonialism has made like, the, the study of my history and my stories tells me that the way that I love is, is Maui, it is real and indigenous, right? It is, it is actually not queer, that this is like a part of, of the ethics of aloha and pleasure of my ancestors, right? So, so when I think about how I hold the legacy of colonialism. I think about how I am constantly, and people like me are constantly having to shift through different identities to, to make space for, for connection, this connection to, to my kupuna and my, and my mo'olalo. But, but also in, in thinking about the body and, and, kind of, and protest and, and activism, I, I think about how powerful 
our physical bodies have been almost as like the last straw to block um, further desecration of, of our lands, right? And, and, and to, to honor our connection to place. So I, I think about the movement to protect Mauna Awakea and not just in 2019 when myself and, and seven others chained ourselves to a cattle guard to block construction vehicles or when 38 kupuna were elders were arrested and hundreds of women took the road and blocked construction vehicles with our bodies but all the times before that our people have put our bodies on the land and and this be moved and and in that not just for ourselves where we realize we're like prostrating ourselves at, at the foot of our mountain um and like and praying to our mountain and, and engaging in like a, a spiritual experience with with our mountain but we're also showing people that to you know violence this is not my phrase obviously but violence on the land is violence on the body right and so i am making that connection for the audience when i say you will literally have to bulldoze through me or pull me off of the ground and zip tie me to pass. Um, and I know this is not something that Hawaiians invented, right? The soft blockade or the hard, hard blockade in, in the face of injustice. But I do think that there is, there is a kind of indigenous ethic to that when we say that, that this land is my body. Um, not just my ancestor, right? Like we, we, we hear that a lot and, and it is important to recognize that like the land is my ancestor, but it is also my body. So that when, when the missiles are coming, when the nuclear missile is coming in 2018 and we're told to take cover, which is the most outrageously stupid thing you could tell people, nobody's surviving if a nuclear missile is coming to Hawaii, but you tell us to take cover, the, the, the OE, in me, the, the indigenous person in me that is connected to me says, why the hell would I want to survive without these mountains? What, what am I taking cover from? My life is to protect land in the same way that it is her job to protect me. And so that's how I think about the body in this, this work. Um, and I think that that raises the level of accountability, right? That, that I know that everything I do to myself, I do to my land and I do to my people and everything I do to the land, I do to myself and the people that I love. There's a, there's, for lack of a better word, right? There's a reciprocity to that. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. What you said uh, about, um, the word queer as opposed to how you inhabit your body and your life, right? I've been thinking about that a lot in relation to um, the word crip, which is like the disability justice version of that, like cripping something is analogous to queering something, but like assume people are disabled before you think they're non-disabled kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, you know, butchering that in crip theory by Robert McCrewer, but in any case, so disability justice itself is a term coined by queer crips of, color artists um, in North America called Sins and Ballad. Um, and I always try and cite them because as Sara Ahmed says, citation is a feminist memory. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm using these English words for, <laughs> you know, I've been really thinking about like, I think in Indonesian it feels different. And I think a big part of um, reclamation is just listening to our bodies and understanding what feels different and why. And I'm thinking about the words for our body minds that we might have lost mm -hmm. or that are there, but we don't know about them from, from our ancestry, um, ways of interacting or ways of being or words for ourselves, like the genders that are, you know, I mean, the, the binary is very colonial, <laughs> you know, like there's, there's, um, there's, <laughs> Uh, cultures in Indonesia with like five genders and part of that genocide in 1965-66 was also to wipe out gender and sexual minorities. Um, and so for me, something that really, um, I'm, I'm, I've been obsessed with like visual cultures, literature, history and memory because um, the earliest traumatic memory I have is um, I was about eight and a half, I think, and I was in an Indonesian school in Jakarta and my parents, because they, you know, met in activism and 
um, had surrounded me thankfully with like exile artists and you know like these really cool elders to look up to had told me like you're gonna go to school and you're gonna learn things that aren't true um, so this so basically there's a film that's very violent that recreates the supposed communist uprising and it depicts communist especially communist including like myths about communist women about genital mutilation of generals excuse me but but i mean these were the kinds of stories we were exposed to at eight right at eight years old right. as a result of american imperialism and these are the kinds of visual and literary traumas that shape my mind Mm. And that I feel I have, and that me and all of my, I mean, this happened for 33 years with this dictatorship, I believe, right? It stopped when I was 13 and it didn't end there because there were still like assassinations. There are still people today being beaten up for refusing to give up their land to palm oil companies and supported by the military, right? The largest gold mine in the world is in West Papua. And that's controlled by, that's supported by the Indonesian military. Like it's, it didn't end just when democracy, you know, came in. These are long histories. Um, and these are really immediate histories that I feel in my body um, and in my friends' bodies. And I, I just remember, again, just an anecdote. Um, there was a showing of a documentary about where a white man, you know, did a documentary on like discovering the Indonesian genocide that was caused by the Americans. And a white British man in the Q&A, because there's a Q&A of the director was like, thank you for showing us these histories that we would never have understood otherwise. Meanwhile, me and my friends are all there like shaking <laughs> because this was, you know, like our childhood traumas, our histories, our, our family members, like Bali is an island of mass graves. This is the thing also about landscaping, <laughs> literal re-landscaping, right? of what a territory means, right? That they can make like beautiful national parks instead of site of genocide against native and you know indigenous Americas. It's like Bali, you know, this beautiful land, not the place where, you know, people were killed en masse by their neighbors mm -hmm. because the US military um, armed, you know, <laughs> like people and gave them a list. And um, it's just, these things are so immediate to me, yet the landscape is so saturated with US imperialistic understandings of memory and of bodies. So when you say the 60s, what do you think of, right? Like all the marches that happened in the 60s that liberal white people remember mm -hmm. is usually what's on mainstream media. Nobody understands that it. it's like, there's an entire genocide in the 60s that was going on and yet people want to come in with international NGOs and teach my people about feminism, you know, as though like, and also about bodies, um, this Ultimatum Orangutan is dedicated to four of my grandmothers. And um, as someone who I'm not going to have children, but I will give birth to books maybe um, is, you know, um, the matrilineal line bloodline is, I mean, earlier in our cultures, husbands could only visit their marital homes at night. <laughs> the house belonged to the women, right? Like this is the culture that I come from. This is such a strong line of resistance. And it gives me a lot of strength to know that my body is a continuation of all of these bodies. And that, you know, my cousins and their daughters are a continuation of this line of resistance, the matra line of resistance. Um, and, and that's what I want to try and focus on and, and try and center because there are so many genocides and so many violent histories that are not, that we're not made aware of because we're, we were taught to not only separate ourselves from nature, but ourselves from fellow indigenous people elsewhere, um, that the lines of communication have been cut in a lot of ways, very violently and deliberately. Um, and so I think of the struggle for, and, and why did this genocide happen was to make way for capitalism, right? Because it was a cold war thing. And so that companies could come in and continue the line of it, this, this wave of extraction that is only intensifying. And it began then, and it began even further back with the start of colonialism. The Dutch East Indies were what Indonesia used to be called. I believe the very first corporation was the VOC. Um, 
or the Dutch East Indies Corporation. So it's where I come from like ground zero of where this idea of corporate capitalism was invented. Um, and all of that is in a swirl with like me and my friends' childhood traumas and my parents' childhood traumas and all of this stuff that has happened to us that is just, it's shocking because Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. It shows you how strong this imperialist propaganda is <laughs> that we're not made aware of. And even people in Indonesia, if their parents didn't teach them about this, probably to protect them, because I have friends like that whose parents were just like, toe the line, don't want any trouble, like just, you know, like just believe in everything, even though they're getting traumatized. Um, who I've had to be like, actually none of that was true, that film, you know, or like Indonesian feminists didn't do that. Um, and it's it's the struggle for memory and it's a struggle for um, remembrance of body minds as soul bodies, is what I like to call it. I think there's something about bodies that sometimes reminds me of violence a lot. And it's like, how can we use the word bodies in a way that is pleasurable and joyful and reconnective? And you say, yes, we've been traumatize the hell out of by these imperialist policies. But um, let's just shimmy for a bit, <laughs> you know? Like, well, you know, like, why don't we just get in our bodies and do an exercise and have fun with each other? It's all part of it because I think ultimately what my grandmothers wanted was for us to experience joy and connectivity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that you you always need to come back to and remember, but it's an exercise, like you said, Heoli, it's a, it's a practice. And exactly like you said, if we don't practice it, we lose it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's it, personally, sometimes it's a bit difficult for me to be between like remembrance and like how devastating all of this history is and mm. joy is, you know, how we're going to get out of this place. I love that. I love that so much. And actually, um, Oka, I feel like you're leading us right to um, exactly where I, I kind of imagined our, our ending this conversation for today. I hope we are able to, you know, gather again and, and continue talking. Um, but I do want to ask both of you just sort of what gives you hope right now? I'm, if you are comfortable sharing, I'm interested in hearing as well as we're talking about the land, if you can sort of mention what your, where are your favorite places in the world? Like, where do you feel most at home and seen and comfortable and loved and heard? Um, but yeah, I would love to end with, with hope and, and the places that we love. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot recently about, the, for my whole life, I never wanted to be anyone other than us. Um, even even in spite of everything that our people have endured, um, I never wanted to be anything other than Hawaiian. And I think of that as a privilege. I, and I think of that as, as a gift of being born in the generation that I was born in. Because I know that uh, even as recently as my father's generation, that there are people who did not grow up with that, that kind of aloha for who we are. Um, and recently I've been thinking about what it is besides our beautiful history and you know our beautiful music and our stories and and all that makes us us that I love so much I think a part of it and I would extend this out to my larger kind of uh, community of comrades is that we do have hope and we do have a vision for something else and I pity the people who really believe that we cannot live another way the people who you say like we have an alternative to capitalism they say there is no alternative to capitalism and we say we have an alternative to mass militarism and they say there is no alternative to mass militarism i pity those people who live in such a darkness even as they are benefiting from that darkness right we know that they are amassing wealth from those beliefs but i still pity them because they cannot see anything else and they cannot imagine anything else and therefore they will never live themselves anything else than than what they have cast what has been cast for them in their imagination um and so that gives me hope i feel like we are the people even despite all the pain we are the people of joy um we are the people of faith and we are the people of hope and and so what gives me hope is us um what, what gives me love is us and, and the places that i feel my favorite places are in the world are the places I am with us. 
Um, and so this last year has been really, really difficult because even though I am definitely an introvert and I need my alone time, um, you know, me and, and my law, who we, we went from participating in the greatest uprising of our people since our illegal overthrow in 1893 the greatest uprising, collective uprising of our people to being stashed away in our houses to protect each other from COVID-19. And so this like incredible contrast of this experience and not being able to be in physical community with my people um, has reminded me how much they are my favorite place. Um, you know, it's it's hard to imagine a place more powerful than either sitting in the center of the ocean on a va on a on a canoe or at the foot of our sacred Mauna Awakea. Um, and I love those places, and those places have have made me strong. And those places are the places where I felt most connected to my people and myself and my my ancestors. Uh, but but even with that, like I choose us. Um, and I choose the way that we collect and, and I am, I am moved by, by the work of the folks of our generation. I'm thinking about a Melanie case who just published a book that I, I haven't read yet. Cause it like literally just came out. I don't, I don't even know if it's in paper form yet called, uh, everything, um, ancient was once new. And, and so I, I think about how, again, like we have seen these endings before. We've seen them over and over and over again, and still yet we are here, and still yet we are creating something different. Um, and that understanding of that, that's what we are, that's who we are, that gives me hope. Um, and spaces like this where we, where we can talk and bring our full selves and bring our trauma and bring that pain and sit in that space together and still laugh at, at, at the fact that they failed right? Settler colonialism is a structure, not an event, and yet it is always incomplete. They continuously fail because of us. Um, so I just want to thank you both for, for this beautiful conversation and, and letting me kind of sit in my joy for the last hour and a half. Likewise, thank you so much to both of you. It's been wonderful. Um, I like the idea of people as places because uh, we were just talking about we are places, we are land, and also people as, as the places where I find um, my favorite, your, your questions, Lily, where are your favorite places in the world, the places you feel most at home, loved, held, comfortable? Um, one is my actual home in Jakarta, <laughs> my, my familial home, uh, which um, I'm only going to get to go there at the end of this year, and it will have been two years since. Um, I really miss my family very, very much. Uh, my partner and I were supposed to go there this past winter and we were unable to. Um, and I also think of my mother's ancestral village, which I, I don't like saying the name because I'm afraid of surveillance and them finding out where, I mean, honestly, um, finding out where this beautiful village is and like turning it into like a yoga retreat paradise or something. Um, but. Uh, uh, and also anywhere where I feel joyful communion, whether it's, you know, the Zoom workshops I hold with women in Jakarta or like this conversation, or um, I recently started a program uh, with Healing Justice London, which is a wonderful group of um, caregivers of color. Uh, they started a program called remit, re, I think it's reimagining medical and institutional trauma, uh, of which I and many people have a lot because again, like Lily, you mentioned my poem in your notes, The World of Stairs, about how the world is built according to colonial ableism, right? Like if disabled and chronically ill bodies were cherished, like our indigenous cultures taught us to cherish them, we would not have this violent, violent inaccessibility and also like everything that has been experienced during this pandemic, your disabled people were already experiencing. Um, I certainly had experience with isolation before this pandemic, which I think has helped, but still is a long time <laughs> to be away from my family and my people um, really testing it. Um, and, and, and this remit program, they have two strands and I was accepted into one called experts by experience. 
which is really cool because it doesn't frame us as like patients or survivors necessarily if you don't want to be you know because we are but it's like your experts by clearly you have your experts with this colonial destructive medical system um how can we reframe it and um it's spaces like that and spaces like just um Oof, recently, if uh, a family member died and I got to go to two of the Zoom prayer meetings, it was so, so beautiful. Um, I cried buckets and I did not feel that I was separate from these people at that time. Um, my dad likes to say that brainwaves are non-local and that when you think something or like give love to somebody, no matter where they are in the world, they will receive that energy, kind of like Reiki principles, I suppose. Um, and if people are places, I think that we can transcend space time and that, that gives me hope and, and exist in a place that is in another kind of realm. Well, thank you both. I love that idea from your dad, actually, Oka, of brainwaves being non-local, especially, I know, Haley, you're in Hawaii, Oka, you're in London, I'm in New York City, and the fact that we can all be together on this Zoom call. Um, has felt so rejuvenating and inspiring and very, very grateful to both of you. I want to take a moment to thank Oka and Heoli once more for joining us in conversation from Hawaii and from London. This was a truly international conversation and we are so grateful for the support of the Poetry Coalition, the Academy of American Poets and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation who made this possible. Again, member organizations of the Poetry Coalition are presenting programming from March through June 2021. You can take a look at what the other organizations involved in the coalition have put together at poets.org. I want to mention Oka's most recent publication once more. That is Ultimatum Orangutan, which you heard her read from earlier in this event. This incredible collection was published in March by Nine Arches Press. Heoli has a book coming out in fall of 2021, which is called Remembering Our Intimacies, Mo'olelo, Aloha'ina, and Ea. That is forthcoming from the University of Minnesota Press. Thank you again to everyone who tuned in to this event, to the Poetry Coalition, and to Nikai, Katie, and Jen in particular for all of their help, and especially to Oka and Heoli for their wisdom and their art and for being here tonight to share it with all of us. Thank you all. Have a good evening.